All right. Welcome, everybody. Looks like uh, we're live. We've been uh, waiting just a few minutes after the top of the hour for everybody to join us, but it looks like everyone is here now. Uh, so welcome, everybody, to Violi's webinar on recycling solvents and finding value upstream. My name is Jim Dykeis, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, you know, just recently, I took a summer vacation uh, that was from an event postponed from last year. Maybe some of you had the same thing. Maybe you had nice trips planned and you got the, the COVID cancellation. Um, you know, it was a great time off, uh, but I can't believe that it's Labor Day already. And I would just be interested to see uh, what you, what everybody here thinks. Um, so I'm just going to publish a poll here. And uh, all right, it should be up now. It says, did the summer go, go by too soon for you? Um, yes, no, or like some of us, maybe wait, it, it's summer. Um, so let's just uh, let this run maybe just 10, 15 seconds just to see how everybody's feeling. And, you know, the, the no's, maybe you were waiting for the kids to go back to school. Um, although it looks like the yes is pulling in front significantly, probably a little over 60%. I'm going to close it here in three, two, one. All right, I've ended the poll. And we did have about 20% uh, percent to, to wait, it's summer. So those are the very busy among us. Uh, and then the balance being uh, uh, you know, about 70% on yes, it went by way too soon. Uh, so hopefully um, the webinar uh, will not go by too soon. And to that extent, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. So I've ready to introduce myself. I'm uh, Jim Dykeis, the marketing director. I've been with uh, Chemical Waste Management, which eventually became Veolia for a little over 37 years. And it's been my pleasure to know both Jim and Ted in that time period. Uh, Jim started his career with about seven years at Laidlaw uh, and then three years at Safety Clean. Um, yes, Laidlaw is a name many of you will remember. Uh, and then he's also been with Veolia now for a little over 20 years, uh, initially as an account manager and then focused kind of specifically on recycling as a product line manager. Ted has over 35 years. Um, interestingly enough, he has 15 years at three different safety clean recycling locations. So excellent operational experience. And he's been director of Reclaim now at Veolia for over 20 years. So those will be our subject matter experts today. Uh, just before we get started, so everybody knows how this will go, uh, Jim and Ted will walk through the content. We will have about 10, 12 minutes at the end for your questions. So please submit those anytime using the chat function. You'll see on the right-hand side. I do have it set to private so that we don't distract each other. I'll be monitoring that and, and asking questions from that. This webinar is being recorded. So watch your inbox for email from us with a slide deck and the YouTube link after this event. Uh, be aware, we, I may move or Jim or Ted may move our thumbnails around a little bit so that we don't cover up content, nothing is wrong. We also have the ability to do a whiteboard. It may change the opacity for a second. Again, shouldn't be a problem. I think those are the, the issues you just kind of be looking for. And then uh, if there is a massive technical difficulty, if I happen to hear from 30 or 40 or 50 of you that says I can't see or I can't hear, I have the ability to hit a, a reset button. Um, and then that would take probably 15 to 20 seconds to do. So with that, uh, I'll just cover the agenda very quickly. For those of you that don't know us very well, if you're not a current customer, I've got just a couple slides as to what Veolia does. Jim will talk about why we should recycle, um, some of the higher uh, you know, aspirational reasons and some of the practical reasons, and then also go through some of the commonly recycled solvents so you can take a look at your operations and see how that fits in. Ted is our technical expert. He'll kind of walk through um, the methodologies, the equipment that's used, depending on the types of solvents that we have. Jim will come back and touch on some regulation specific to recycling. And then I'll go over a case study uh, pretty quickly and then we'll have a um, time for questions and answers after that. So this is our uh, slide that our attorneys ask us to put in. Primarily, it, you know, in the middle there, I think it's buried. If you have a environmental regulatory question, you should seek your own environmental counsel. We do have this little brief section. I think there's three slides on regulations. And uh, so we are not saying that we are the experts. Uh, we advise you to seek your own expertise. So we've got that covered. All right, um, just introducing Violi very quickly here. You can see we are a global water waste and energy company. 
Um, some people think of us as a utility. In some cases, that's correct. Maybe when you're looking at supplying water to cities, supplying heat loops um, to cities, now, obviously with a hazardous waste side, it's not so much a utility. Uh, $30 billion in global revenue. This is 2020 with 181,000 employees in approximately 48 countries. And then the North America side of that is 4% of the workforce and about 2 billion in revenue. And that 4% is about almost 6,900 employees. This is the hazardous waste side uh, that we will be talking about today. Um, and so we offer a broad range of on-site services as well as treatment and disposal services that happen offsite uh, with a focus on sustainable circular economy solutions. Uh, we'd love to talk with you about any challenges you would have. You can uh, visit our website and uh, just do a contact us there. Um, today, you can see the four stars kind of uh, arrayed from east to west or west to east, depending on how you like to look at it, starting maybe with uh, Azusa, California, Henderson, Colorado, West Carrollton, Ohio, and Middlesex, New Jersey. We also have one just across the border in Canada. Some of our literature refers to five sites um, in case you happen to see that. So that is our uh, the introduction. I would be more than happy to turn it over to Jim and Ted. And I think, Jim, you're going to kick us, kick us off here with why we should recycle. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, I'll just go through a, a, a few things on why um, solvent recycling is an important part of, uh, you know, uh, the EPA hierarchy. So here's some uh, quick reasons on why we recycle solvents. First of all, it's the right thing to do for the environment. Um, if you look at the EPA hierarchy down in the right hand corner, you can see that, you know, first things first, you know, reduce and reuse um, are, are the first, you know, the top of the hierarchy, but then recycling is next on the list. So it's really high up there, you know, it helps out the environment. Um, and uh, in some cases, we'll get you some recycling credits with the state that you're operating in. Um, I, and actually when uh, solvents are shipped for recycling, they ship under an HO20 management code, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with the management codes on the manifests. Um, and HO20 is for solvent recycling as opposed to like HO40 for incineration or HO61 for fuel blending. So again, that HO20 management code on your manifest might get you some recycling credits with your state. Um, obviously, when you recycle your solvents, you're going to save money. Um, you're not having to buy the replacement virgin solvent um, that you would have had to buy if you would have disposed of that material. Um, and, and again, by recycling that, you're uh, not only saving money, but you're saving resources um, now and in the future. And, and we'll get into a little bit more in that in the slides to come. Um, and, and solvent recycling, every company now has like zero landfill goals or sustainability goals, you know, or ESG goals, which is, you know, environment, social and governance goals. Um, so most companies are trying to go zero landfill and trying to be as green as possible and reduce their carbon footprint. Um, and solvent recycling is a big part of that. Um, and lastly, you know, sometimes you can take solvents off of a has waste manifest if they're going for recycling. Um, and that could potentially reduce your generator status. Um, just, you know, if you're a company that only has a solvent stream and you use a lot of solvent and that's what makes you a large quantity generator, if, if we're able to take that off a of manifest um, due to the recycling aspects of, of that stream, you could potentially go from a large quantity generator to a small quantity generator or even a conditionally exempt generator, which that would simplify your, your operations if you were able to do that. So the next slide. Um, this is just a quick historical snapshot. Um, in 20, and this is Veolia specific. This isn't um, geared towards the whole solvent recycling industry. But as far as Veolia, in 2019, we recycled about 210,000 tons of solvents. Um, they, that resulted in a large virgin product cost savings for our customers. Um, we get about a 65% recovery on average 
Um, so that 65% of the solvent that they're using, they didn't have to buy as virgin product. So that's a big cost savings. Um, and obviously if you're, you know, recycling your solvents, you're saving on trans and disposal. Um, if you would have had to dispose of that solvent instead of recycling it. And, and now here's the big one. This is, I was kind of alluding to this in the slide previously, but um, as far as going green and reducing your carbon footprint, um, solvent recycling has a big impact on greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so for that 210,000 tons of solvents, to recycle that, we generated 54,000 tons uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, for that same amount of solvent to be manufactured um, from virgin, like from crude oil, um, 365,000 tons of carbon dioxide would have been produced um, from manufacturing virgin solvent as you know, compared to recycling um, the, the spent solvent. So that's a huge savings. That's 311,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions that were saved. Um, and, and then if you look at the, the disposal part of that, if you would have disposed of that material, you would have generated another 172,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions by burning it um, for disposal. So just to break this down in like layman's terms, for every like one ton of solvents that are recycled, you're saving about seven, about seven tons, maybe even eight tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that's about the equivalent of taking about 130,000 cars off of the highways each year. So there, there's a huge impact on, on climate change and, and uh, global warming and, and reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is just a slide on commonly recycled solvents. Um, and, and again, this is just a partial list. These are ones that we see in the industry a lot. Um, so, you know, obviously there's tons of solvents out there. Almost any organic solvent can be recycled. Again, this is just a partial list of the most common ones we see. We see. Acetone's a big one. Acetonitrile's a big one. Automotive purge solvents is a big one. Ethanol is a very big one. Um, and again, we see a lot of these. Uh, methylene chloride is another big one. NMP is another big one. And, and these are coming from you know large industries like pharmaceutical, lithium-ion battery manufacturers. Obviously, you know there's tons of automotive plants in the U.S. that are making cars, and every one they make, they got to paint. Um, and every time they change colors, they have to purge those paint lines. So you can imagine the, the amount of automotive purge solvents coming out. But again, these are just the common ones that we see in the industry. This is not an all-inclusive list. Um, so there you go. You get a little bit of a, a look at, at, you know, what other people are recycling. Um, Jim, can you move the... Uh, the videos. Thank you. Um, okay, other considerations. Hold on, let me turn that off. Okay. Um, volumes generated, you know, you have to look at how much volume that, you know, most recycling plants, including violias, um, the, the distillation equipment is, is fairly large. You know, so most companies are looking for, you know, larger volumes of spent solvents to recover. So uh, we, we typically ask generators to save up full truckloads, whether that be um, tankers or full, you know, trucks of drums or whatever. So, you know, one of the, the questions that you need to ask is, do you have enough tank space to save up full loads or warehouse space to save up 90 drums before you ship? Um, you know, so that, that, that goes into consideration for recycling streams. And, and that leads us to the packaging. Most solvent recycling facilities can receive any types of packages, whether that's drums or totes or tankers or rail cars. Um, so, you know, th that's pretty easily accommodated. Um, sh shipping frequency plays a role. You know, we're, we're lo looking to do larger batches. So uh, if you're shipping... 20 drums a month as opposed to, you know, 50 drums a week, 
Um, that's going to play into how efficiently it can be recycled. Um, and then you also have to look at the back end market. Um, if this isn't going to be told back to the generator for reuse and it's just going to be uh, marketed as a recycled solvent, you have to make sure that there's a product demand for that. Um, you could be the only generator generator out there using that solvent um, and no one else is interested in, in using it. So uh, again, the product demand on the back end plays a role as well. Um, and then uh, part of the upstream uh, thought process about this is, you know, uh, some generators, a lot of generators, they only have one waste tank. They might be running five different processes, but they all go to one waste tank. And so all that waste solvent is getting mixed together and it could be getting mixed together with other stuff like water or, or you know, something like that. So we can look at your processes upstream to see if, it, you know, if you could segregate that and, you know, segregate out one or two solvents that might turn a waste stream into a recycling stream. So uh, you can always evaluate your process upstream. And again, you know, if there's a solvent not on the list, that's not a problem. Most organic solvents are recyclable. That was just a, a list of the common ones. So, you know, if you have a solvent that you think could be, you know, recoverable, you know, just, uh, I guess, uh, evaluate that and see if it can. Um, and then product quality, this is another factor that goes into recycling solvents. I mentioned pharmaceuticals earlier. Um, if, if those, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies really need high purity solvents to use in their process, so obviously they're making pharmaceuticals, you know, and medications for people to take. So they need that really high ultra pure solvent to do that manufacturing process. Um, other places like paints, paints and coatings, you know, or, or cleaning operations, they don't really need that high of, of purity. So, you know, even if we take a solvent from a pharmaceutical manufacturer, we can recycle that and place it into a paint manufacturing operation who uh, has no issues with maybe a little bit lesser quality. So these are just some of the uh, factors that go into solvent recycling and when we're evaluating opportunities. And I believe that takes us um, to the next section, but I believe Mr. Dykeist has something. Jim, you're on mute, I believe. Yes, I was. I only turned on my video. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm going to make available a list uh, of commonly recycled solvents that Jim just went through. It's in a nice little downloadable PDF. You'll find that over on the right-hand side. Um, that folder's available anytime you want to go ahead and grab it. And go ahead. I believe we're to Ted. All right. Thank you, Jim and Jim. So let's talk about uh, how our solvents recycled. And one of the common examples that we all are aware of is how do we make moonshine? So when we're making moonshine, what we'd be doing is filling up a pot with uh, mash and the fermented sugars into alcohol, and then we would apply heat to it. Um, that would start to boil the lower boiling component, which is the ethanol, and that would leave the pot and then go through a cooler uh, which would be surrounded by a cooling media, water, glycol, whatever that might be. And then the vapors would then turn into a liquid and fall into a receiver. Um, that would be our product that we're looking for, the, the ethanol, the moonshine. Uh, when the distillation is done, the waste materials in the pot would be uh, sent away for disposal, uh, used for fertilizer or you know some other uh, means if they can. So when we look at um, distillation, uh, one, one form of uh, simple distillation <clears throat> is simple distillation. Uh, basically what we're doing here is removing dissolved solids to produce a clear colorless product. Um, and most of the simple distillation equipment, uh, some, some of the desired product, we have to leave it behind. Um, otherwise, uh, those residues would go solid. So we need to leave some product behind uh, to keep the material flowable. Um, the waste portion is typically blended into a waste fuel for energy recovery. Uh, and examples of simple distillation equipment would be a pot still, uh, which is good for small batches. Um, and then a thin film and a white film evaporator, which are better suited for 
larger streams in continuous operation. An example of simple distillation would be uh, painting equipment. Uh, once it's done being used, uh, it's, it has the paint pigments and, and the uh, leftover paint in it. So that would be flushed away with a cleaning solvent. We could take then that, that dirty cleaning solvent and evaporate the good solvent portion to be reused again, uh, leaving some behind to keep it, keep it flowable. And the pigments and the dirty part of the, the waste stream uh, would then be sent away for uh, fuel blending and energy recovery. Another form of distillation is fractional distillation. In this case, it's used to separate one solvent from another uh, based on their boiling points. Um, products can be purified to near 100%. Um, and essentially, the fractional distillation is uh, a series of simple distillations uh, stacked on top of one another. At each stage, the vapor going up becomes richer in the lower boiling component. And then the, uh, the liquid that flows down through each stage, each tray becomes richer in the higher boiling component. An example of this would be separating methanol um, from water. Methanol has a boiling point of 148 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, uh, whereas water is 212. So what we would expect is that the methanol would travel up the column and then the water would travel down each one of these stages and we would get uh, pure water at the bottom and pure methanol at the top. So other methods and uh, equipment that we may use are uh, molecular sieve. <clears throat> it's used to uh, adsorb uh, one solvent preferentially over another. This equipment is typically used to, uh, to remove water from solvents. Um, it's just a, a more efficient way and enable uh, our abil ability to separate water from, from the solvent. And then a liquid-liquid extractor, it separates the solvents based on solubility. Uh, membranes uh, separates based on the size of the solvent molecule. And then in some cases, we can use chemical reactions uh, like neutralization, esterification, and hydrolysis to convert uh, solvents into a, a different molecule, uh, which can be more easily separated from one another. So you might want to ask yourself, well, can a waste stream be recycled um, as opposed to fuel blending or some other treatment? The answer to that is yes, um, but that's going to depend on the value of the solvent and uh, some other factors. So, Ted, I'm sorry, is is there like kind of rules of thumbs uh, that the generators can use as far as how much solids or how much water or, you know, can be in a solvent stream and still be recyclable? Well, when it comes to solids, you know, we kind of cut the limit there at about 25%. Um, our rule of thumb is we leave one part of a good solvent behind for every good part of, of solids. So you can see that the more solids there is, the more good solvent loss there's going to be. As far as water goes, um, both the solids and the water, neither, neither one of those um, are portions that we're going to recover and they don't have any value. So the, the more percentage of those two waste components there are in a waste stream, the less recoverable solvent there is, and um, there's going to be more disposal. So that the more of water and the more solids in there, the more that stream represents a disposal stream. Okay, thanks. So reclamation options, uh, one is recycle, where the solvent is recycled and the product is sold to a third party. Um, toll would be where we would uh, recycle the, the waste material and the product will go back to the generator and would meet their specification. Uh, beneficial reuse, in some cases, the waste is gently or lightly used and, and it still has good uh, quality that can be used as is uh, by a third party. And then in some cases, uh, the solvent can be recycled, the waste solvent can be recycled on site um, and then the, the product reused by the generator and then a waste uh, company, you know, like Violi would come and take the uh, the waste portions away. And, you know, how do we evaluate the stream for recycling? Um, you know, a sample and a profile sheet's needed so that we understand what the waste material looks like. Um, those samples have to go through a rigorous process development uh, procedure to determine 
what technology is required to yield and the product rate and the, the processing rates. And then in most cases, there's going to be a trial load that has to go to a recovery facility to test that and make sure that it uh, meets specs and that the economics and the process uh, hold up. Uh, Mr. Moderator's back. Yes, I am. And I, I had myself off mute this time. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ted. Just I'll let you finish this slide. But on that last one, we he kind of walked through what are the options, right, of recycling, tolling, beneficial reuse, or on-site. So I'm going to make another uh, file available for you. It's just a nice recap of that, a little bit of an infographic. So again, if you check over on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see your ability to download that file. So go ahead, Ted, take it away. Thanks, Jim. So other considerations, uh, one is the value of the solvent. The higher the value, the more cost uh, can to recover it can be absorbed uh, by that, the value of that solvent. Rule of thumb is the cost of the recycled solvent should be less than the waste disposal. Um, solid content, uh, as we talked about already, we must leave good solvent behind. So the more solids there, there is, the more waste product there is. Um, the portion of the recoverable solvent, so the less solvent there is contained, again, there's more disposal and then the stream looks more like a disposal stream. And then the cost, the complexity and the yield of the process does add cost. Um, and again, the value that that solvent and how much we recover has to cover those costs. Uh, reactive components could be a problem. They could be a safety issue. Um, they could convert you know, our desired product into something that we're, we don't want. Um, and then polymerization concerns can cause waste of, uh, the, of the fractions to go solid and uh, plug up the storage and recovery equipment. And uh, at this point, we'll turn it back over to Jim and he'll talk about regulations. Okay, well, thank you, Ted. Um, this is just a couple slides on RICRA regulations that affect solvent recycling. I'm sure everyone, if you're a has waste generator are familiar with RICRA and you know Resource Conservation Recovery Act. Um, most solvent wastes are either characteristic or listed wastes, um, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, you know, D codes and F codes and UNPs. Um, but when you get into solvent recycling, there are some uh, exemptions that are available that, that could remove the material from RICRA, allow you to ship on a bill of lading and, and uh, exempt these waste streams from RICRA. Um, if you look to the right a little bit, this is just a flow chart that we use. It, you know, it helps generators walk through, you know, if you have a material and you're trying to decide whether it's a has waste or not, you can use this flow chart, you know, just to say, does it meet the definition of a solid waste? And if not, then it, you know, it's not subject to record regulation. But if it does, yeah, I'm, I'm actually not going to walk through this whole flow chart, but you can see it. Um, you know, just a series of questions, you know, if it is a solid waste, is there an exclusion available? Um, if not, you know, is it characteristic um, or listed, you know, and it's just a series of questions to, to let you determine whether, you, you know, the, the stream you have is going to be RIC or regulated. Um, so back to the regulations, um, back in 2015, the EPA was really wanting to promote recycling. Um, so they went ahead and they rewrote the definition of a solid waste. I um, mean, the rewrite of that definition allowed for exemption of, of solvent streams for recovery and recycling. Um, it went on for about two or three years. There was a lot of comments from generators and recyclers, um, both, you know, to, to tweak it a little bit. So actually in 2018, the US EPA revised the definition of solid waste again to try to incorporate some of those concerns and, and what they learned over those three years. Um, so what it basically has done is, is it's made um, exemptions available to remove solvent streams from RICRA um, if they're being sent for recycling. Um, and, and they're basically categorized as a hazardous secondary material or HSM. Um, part of these regulations, though, you know, it's the US EPA that, that changed these, these um, regulations. So each state has to adopt those changes. Um, some states have, some states haven't. You'll see it in an upcoming slide. Um, I believe we have a map of, of the states. 
Um, and then lastly, before we leave this slide, you know, there are some solvents that are just non-regulated to begin with. They're not a characteristic waste. They're not a listed waste. You know, it, like NMP, for example, um, I think NMP has a flash point of like 199 degrees Fahrenheit, which technically it's still a combustible liquid. And when you ship it in bulk, it still ships as a combustible liquid, but drum quantities of NMP are actually considered non-regulated. So there are some solvents out there that can be recycled and um, not part of RICRA. So here's the map I was referring to. Um, these, you know, these are the states that have adopted the new DSW regs. Um, it's color coded. Um, basically, you can see the uh, the um, what's it called the the cues down at the bottom. I'm sure that's not the right word, but basically, the red and blue states. And no, it has nothing to do with politics. Um, are the states that have uh, adopted the regs? Um, you can see there's a couple states. Um, here, I'm going to turn this on. You can see a couple states like Colorado and Washington um, have not, you know, they adopted the mandatory portions, but that was it. And then all the states that are like in beige or tan, those are states that have not adopted any portions of the new regulations. And, and why this is important is, you know, in order to use any of these DSW exemptions, you have to be in a state, like your state has to have, you know, if you're a generator, your state has to have the regs adopted. And if you're shipping outside your state to a recycler, that state that the recycler is in also has to have the, the regulations adopted. So say you're, you're in Texas, you're a generator in Texas and you're shipping to a recovery facility in Illinois. Um, should be able to do that easily, you know, both state, you know, Texas has adopted it, Illinois has adopted it. And, and the last point I'll, I'll make on this is that, you know, if you're traveling, see all these states that you're traveling through, um, technically those states have to have the regs adopted too. Because um, if you were going from like Texas to New Jersey and you went through Mississippi and you went through Maryland to, to get to New Jersey, um, Mississippi and Maryland don't have the DSW regs adopted. So if you're traveling through those states and you don't have a has waste manifest, that could be an issue going through those states. So in those instances, what we typically do is we fill out a bill of lading and we fill out a has waste manifest and we send it both with the truck because you need that has waste manifest to get through states that have not adopted the new regs yet. So once you get to the receiving facility, you obviously use the bill of lading as the shipping document uh, and you don't use the has waste manifest, but you still need that has waste manifest to get through the states that haven't adopted the regs. Um, so this is a form that, that Veolia uses. I'm sure there's other forms from other companies, you know, in the industry, but, uh, what this does is, is uh, you know, the EPA wants to guard against sham recycling. You know, they don't want someone just trying to force a waste stream into a recycling situation to get it out of RICRA, and there's really no value to recycling that that stream, um, which obviously would be, you know, um, sham recycling, and, and the EPA wants to guard against that. So we put this form together just to help generators go through a series of questions, you know, to make sure that the stream that they're shipping for recycling is a legitimate recycling stream. Um, I know the, the print's real small, you can't really see it, but if you look at this list in the middle, which here I'll try to circle it, this list right here, there's actually nine exemptions that can be used. Not all of these are solvent related. Like you can see one, I don't know if you can read it or not, is for sulfuric acid, which is right there. Another one is precious metals, which is right there. So, you know, outside of solvent recycling, there's also exemptions available for other materials. Um, but the, you know, big ones in here are like ethanol um, or hazardous secondary material. Um, you know, those are the two big ones that are used for solvent recycling. There's one here for direct reuse. Um, you know, scrap metal, precious metals, things like that. And then as Ted mentioned earlier, you know, if the material can be used as is, 
you know, obviously, you know, RICRA wouldn't apply because it's technically not a waste. Um, so again, you know, we walk generators through this. This becomes an addendum to their waste profile and we keep it on file at our facilities when we have a recycling stream coming in. This allows us to, if we get inspected by, you know, the state EPA agency, which, you know, all of our facilities do, when they come in and they want to check to make sure that, you know, we're not sham recycling any streams, we can pull this out of our files, show them the waste profile, show them the legitimacy criteria form, um, and they can see, you know, quite clearly that, that the stream qualifies as a legitimate recycling stream. And I believe that's it for me. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, before I jump into this case study, I'm just going to open one last poll. I'll publish it right now. So again, you should see this. It's open right now uh, on the right side in your toolbar. Have you tried to recycle before but were unable? And then why? What's the rationale or what was the problem? Uh, first one is the volume was too small. Second, it's a mixture of solvents. The third, other waste characteristics, odor, physical properties, et cetera. Fourth one, low product recovery, or the fifth one, maybe it was not economical. So again, we've got a few moments here. I'll give you uh, some time to respond. Okay. No Jeopardy theme? No, I don't have, you know, I should do that. Um, <laughs> and I'm not gonna try to hum it either. Uh, all right, looks like, um, they're coming in here pretty good. Yeah, it's always interesting. The longer it goes on, a pattern emerges. All right, so maybe I'll give you about another 10 seconds here and we'll. All right, and I will close the poll. Okay, so it looks like and these are approximate rough numbers uh, based on the the people we have attending. Um, volume too small, really kind of a low number, around five, mixture of solvents, um, maybe 10% of the people. The big clump was probably the next two. Uh, other ways characteristics. So we saw a lot of people having trouble with that, uh, order and physical properties, and then also a big chunk with product recover, low product recovery, which kind of makes it not economical to recycle. So really the last three, uh, were the biggest reasons. So maybe that matches up uh, with your own experience. Um, so I can close that poll. And uh, okay. All right. Let me now just run through our case study uh, very briefly. We had a, uh, a customer um, that was using NMP. Jim referenced that solvent already in methylperilidone. And it's notoriously difficult to recycle. Uh, specifically, it gets thick and tacky after use, and uh, that made that kind of solidification made it very difficult to manage, to handle, and made it very hard to recycle. Um, the customer had tried to do it and were unable to, so they were incinerating this material. So you can imagine Jim went through the reasons why you would recycle. Um, so there's an environmental loss, uh, the greenhouse gas, the fact that you're pretty, putting out six times as much to produce it from um raw material as it is to recycle let alone the cost to buy the new um, material so the customer approached us and said can viola help out and uh, i will say that it took us some time um ted i know you were involved in that uh figuring out the process involved and uh, we did get a sample and ran it through the labs and we were able to find that it was uh, suitable for recycling and we developed a proprietary method to do that. So the customer then obviously gets huge benefits, right? Um, eliminated the wasting of a resource. So that gives them the ESG reporting, which is becoming more and more important these days to show um, the reduced greenhouse gas uh, that was produced in this process, right? Jim went through those numbers. It's significantly less if you can recycle versus doing virgin. Um, they also reduced the cost of purchasing virgin product by 85% because that's, we had a, a very high recovery rate. Uh, so the customer realized um, probably three or four major benefits just by going through that process uh, and taking the time and giving us the chance to, to work it through the process development process. 
and it was a, a great outcome for them. Uh, so let's wrap up before we take your questions. So you do still have time if you want to pop those into uh, chat. I've got a, a list going. So thank you, everybody, for running those in there. Um, right now, is, if I were to summarize this, so if someone says, hey, you were on a webinar, what did you learn? Um, kind of four quick points. Save the earth while saving money. That's we tried to, to make that obvious. But yeah, and Tim, I, I just want to hit that point one more time because yeah. that's huge. I mean, for every ton of solvent that's recycled, you're removing seven tons of greenhouse gas emissions from the planet. Right. So that's just that's huge. Yeah. And that, that's the great that's the save the earth portion. And then depending on your recovery rate, you're not having to buy that product again. Um, we also talked about that you may have recoverable solvents. Jim went through the list. Uh, I think. Uh, Jim also went through some considerations, as did Ted, that perhaps going upstream, you may want to look at, um, you know, adding a tank, uh, to adding a second pipe, um, just evaluating that. So maybe you're not mixing two materials that are not recoverable. Um, and then there are a lot of technologies that Ted went through uh, on the recycling side to try to recover and give you a solution uh, for a problem solvent. So don't don't lose hope. And then, of course, uh, a great point that Jim went through, these the hazardous secondary materials, the regulations have really been developed to encourage legitimate recycling. And uh, if you take a few steps, you can find a good solution. So time for questions. And uh, I guess Jim and Ted, in, in no particular order, I, I can ask these. Um, uh, somebody asked about the, the suitability of streams for recycling in terms of solids and water. Um, what about water? Can you elaborate on water content in recycling? Yeah, so so again, you know, there's, there's basically three portions to any waste stream. You got the recoverable solvent and then you've got solids and then, and then water. And typically we're not going to try to recover the water and that becomes a disposal piece. But water is a little tricky uh, with some solvents. It, it uh, forms what we call an azeotrope. So in some cases, water is difficult to separate from solvents. Uh, it can be done. You know, uh, distillation may not be the traditional way to do that. It may require a molecular sieve or a, a membrane in order to do that. Um, but uh, wa water is, is a little, little tricky when it comes to separation. And just like solids, it is, is a waste portion of the stream. So the more water, the more solids there is in a stream, the less recoverable solvent, the more waste there is, or more cost of waste, and uh, less less solvent to absorb the cost of that recovery process. Yeah, so Ted, that's kind of tied to the value of that solvent then too. Like a, an expensive solvent could, you know, maybe have more water in the waste stream and still be a viable recycling candidate as opposed to a, a you know, a less expensive solvent. That, that's right, Jim. And so if we were to use examples uh, at, the, at the extremes, it would be like NMP and methanol. Methanol is very cheap. Um, we can't recycle it, but uh, the cost to do it sometimes challenges uh, the value of that solvent. So in some, most cases, disposal and replacement reversion is going to be the option. But when it comes to NMP, it, it can get pretty low as far as the contained uh, concentration, um, as long as the, the recovery process isn't so uh, overwhelming that that it eats up all the cost that the value of that solvent has. OK. I don't know if we lost you just at the, the last second there, Ted. We'll just check on this next question. Um, so you talked about solids. You talked about water. The next question is, are there solvent contaminants that would prevent acceptance? Um, well, reactives are, are an issue. Um, solvents that have a objectionable odor. I mean, we do have uh, vapor recovery equipment. Uh, in the facilities, but uh, the one thing th that we don't want to see happen is uh, to emit any dangerous contaminants um, or objectionable ones uh, in into the atmosphere. Um, the other thing is some some solvents, when they're together uh, and they're heated, they could react. 
Um, and then some solvents are just difficult to separate. Could be from an azeotrope, as I mentioned earlier, you know, like water and ethanol, for example. Um, but um, every pair of components uh, of different chemicals have their own unique uh, ability to separate from one another. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point, Ted. Every waste stream is kind of unique in itself. There, there might be some common ones out there in the market, but most, you know, every waste stream is going to be a little bit different than the other. And it's basically why, you know, any solvent recycler out there is going to look at that stream on an individual basis and request a sample and just make sure that, that it's a, a good recovery candidate. Okay. Um. Jim, this one may be yours. Uh, I think it may be talking about some of the RECRA reporting. Will the weight of spent solvents sent out for recycling count as RECRA weight generated by a, by a generator? And, and again, that would depend. I mean, if you can use one of the HSM exemptions, then the answer would be no. But, you know, if you can't use an exemption um, or you're in a state that hasn't adopted those regulations yet, so there are no exemptions available to you, then yeah, that waste is going to ship on a has waste manifest and would be counted towards, you know, waste generation pounds. Okay. Uh, this will be an interesting one. Uh, how will the regulations interact for possible streams generated from territories under the Basel Convention? And obviously, you know, if you're signatory, if both entities are signatories, you cannot import. But I don't know if you know that one or not. Uh, yeah, th that one would probably be best for our regulatory department. Um, I do know that, you know, importing and exporting hazardous waste requires, spe you know, specific notifications to the US EPA and, and you know, other countries or, or territories. Um, as far as using those exemptions for solvent recycling, I doubt that any of those territories probably have those regulations adopted. Um, they may, they may not, and I'm, I'm really not schooled enough to to give you a you know a perfect answer on that. But then we could ask our regulatory department. Okay, fair enough. Um, a lot of people saying, "Hey, can we get a copy of the HSM form?" Um, Yes, we can certainly make that available. Also, if you are a current customer, you could get it from your account manager if you haven't pursued that yet. Um, here's a good one. Uh, is solvent recycling always the cheaper option, even against low water, thin, high BTU, flammable liquids for fuel blending? Or is it more economical only on a case-by-case -case basis? So um, i take that one. Well, I, I can chime in a little bit. Um, most of the time, it's more economical than disposal and replacing it with virgin solvent. Um, but again, I'm going to go back to the, the greenhouse gas emissions. You know, if you really are interested in zero landfill and reducing your carbon footprint, and even if a solvent stream was close to the same economics as disposal and replacement, it's really the prudent thing to do. Um, again, one ton versus seven tons of greenhouse gas emissions. You know, so that, that should be part of any generator's decision when they're looking at recycling a solvent stream. But I'm sure Ted wants to chime in on this too, because, you know, typically we try to make sure, or we, you know, when we're doing streams, we're trying to make sure that those costs um, come in lower than, than the virgin versus disposal. Yeah, that's right, Jim. Um, the, the complexity of the process is is a main factor there. Um, and again, I, I can't stress enough, you know, the more portion of the stream that is goes for disposal, um, it becomes a disposal stream. You know, if it's a third solvent, a third water, a third solid, well, two thirds of it is a disposal stream. So, so now you've only got a third of that solvent and the value of it to, to cover the expense of the disposal of the two thirds and whatever the, the costs are to recover it. You know, Jim, another thing that, you know, we haven't talked about, which is really a significant factor these days is transportation. And uh, that, that, that is a huge cost when it comes to uh, shipping materials uh, from location to location. So, you know, as much as we want to think about disposal and, and processing costs, uh, transporting those wastes and those products uh, has become a very significant cost factor. 
especially in today's market. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so it's a very nuanced answer. Uh, appreciate your your responses. Everything is very straightforward. Um, here's a specific one. Have you had any success with solvents containing silicone contaminants? Um, we have, um, but but that's that's a case where we have to be very careful, particularly when we're dealing with paints and coating solvents, uh, silicone compounds, and those waste streams, and any contamination of those those solvent streams can be a real problem for the user of those solvents. So uh, in some cases, we have been successful. We have to make sure that that stays out of uh, the product of, for other customers. Um, and, and it could be a deal killer. Um, you know, as far as recovering silicone compounds, we haven't, we haven't done that. It, um, I like to believe anything can be recycled. But silicone compounds, when it comes to solvent recovery, are, are a little tricky. Yeah, and again, it'll depend on you know the specific silicone compound because some of those silicone compounds are very high boiling, so they will stay in the still bottoms and not come over with the product. As Ted mentioned, you know, silicone compounds and painting operations don't mix at all. You know, that's what you get the craters in the paint and the fish eyes in the paint. So, a lot of the solvents that are recycled go into that paints and coatings market. So you got to be real careful that you keep the silicones out of the product. Okay. Um, similar one here, maybe. Uh, what is the process of recycling waste acetone that is mixed with styrene? Kind of a specific question, but. Yeah, we see that a lot. Um, typically from the boating industry, um, you know, they're using acetone, you know, when, when they're manufacturing the boats and, and using, you know, the fiberglass and, and styrene to do that. So we see that a lot. And as long as styrene's in there in small quantities, you know, we can still recycle it. But again, it's a monomer. We have to guard against polymerization in the distillation column. So uh, you can't have a, a large concentration of styrene in the acetone and still be able to recycle it. Okay. Um, here we go. Uh, are your facilities able to handle the recovery of organic acids, acetic acid or propionic acid? Ted? No, not not at this time. We don't we don't process any organic acids. Okay. Um, looks like uh, here we go. If I recycle on site, for instance, acetone. Does that count against my generator status? No, no, for, for, you know, I guess a general answer is no. Um, it, it would depend on the, your specific situation, but if you're recycling your own solvents on site, typically all that's required is notification to your state that you're doing it. Um, but there's no permitted permitting required and it would not be like, you're not generating a waste and then, treating it yourself it's basically you know you're recycling your own solvent so it was never a waste to begin with but jim wouldn't the um the waste generated from that on-site process be counted against as a, as a hazardous waste yes yeah, yeah the still the still bottoms from that process or any waste generated from that process would still be probably i mean obviously you'd have to look at the still bottoms and make sure but yeah ch chances are they're going to be a has waste Okay. And it looks like maybe one last question here we can fit in. Um, you've mentioned a little bit that solvent prices are linked to the price of oil, hydrocarbons. Um, how are they influenced? Are they always linked? Um, what would you say to that one? Yeah, some of them. Uh, you know, some mm -hmm. solvents, uh, well, I, I don't know if I'd say the majority of solvents, but yeah, there, there are solvents that are manufactured from refining crude oil. So the price of crude oil is a significant factor in the price of those solvents, um, like benzene, toluene, you know, a lot of the aromatics um, come from crude oil. So, you know, if the price of crude oil goes way up, then the price of, ac you know, not really acetone, but the price of toluene, xylene, benzene, they're going to go up as well. Um, and if, uh, flip side of that when crude oil goes down so do the price of the solvents go down so 
Um, if it's a solvent that is made from refining crude oil, then yeah, it's got a direct correlation to the price of crude oil. Okay, great. Well, I thank everybody for uh, putting those questions in the chat. Um, I think we can wrap up here. I'll just uh, go to my thank you slide and, you know, obviously thank you so much for attending. Uh, we hope that this was valuable to you. Thanks for sticking with us. Um, again, keep an eye on your inboxes for a follow up on the webinar. Our next webinar is scheduled for September 30 on total waste management, what a total waste management, zero waste landfill program looks like, how to implement, etc. Uh, again, you can be watching our webpage. We'll have the registration. Uh, coming up there probably around mid-September. Um, you probably will get an invite as well as you attended this. Maybe you're, you'd be interested in that. You can share that with folks in your organization that maybe are more engaged in a total waste management program. Uh, we're about to end things now, uh, but if you stay on for a moment right afterwards, there will be a simple one question survey, uh, not from us, it's from the actual platform, just basically on how we did. So if you got a, an extra second, please let us know there. And this now ends our webinar. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Greenhouse gas. All right. Thanks. <laughs>